All right, folks, uh, diagnosed with bipolar type 1 disorder at the age of 16, filmmaker, musician, Jamar McFarlane, uh, knew that support from loved ones and discipline to follow up and treatment would have helped him manage uh, the mental illness he's been living with uh, for 11 years. These 11 years, he's right here with us now and, and very brave to, to come and share that story um, with, with, with us. Um, someone very close to me um, suffers from schizophrenia. So I kind of have an idea of what's going on, but what is bipolar? Okay, so bipolar, as we mostly know, it's a mood disorder. So, you know, we're used to hearing about the extreme switches in mood and behavior from excessive highs to excessive lows, but it's a little more than that. Um, somebody experiencing type one, such as myself, is more on the manic end. So all bipolar people, we fluctuate from manic to depressive, but type one, you're more manic. So you're more high energy, you know, bouncing off the walls, whereas type two, they're more depressive. So they're more fluctuate downwards to depressive episodes. So what's characterized by me, because everybody's a little different, it manifests differently, but mine was particularly severe where I would get hallucinations, um, delusions of grandeur, where that's where you ideate kind of dangerous ideas about yourself. Maybe you think you are a messiah, maybe you think you have abilities, maybe you think you're seeing and hearing things that aren't there because your brain is going a million miles an hour and it's just to show the power of the brain if you think and believe and perceive that, you know, you have this ability to shoot fire out your palms, then yeah. you're going to act as if that's so. In preparing for this, it says you were diagnosed with bipolar type 1 right before entering sixth form at Arden. How did you know? And what was going on before that? Were you, yeah. as far as you were concerned, you were I just, was normal, you were, right? You were, well, you're still normal, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, but how did you know that something, something was maybe right. wasn't right? Yeah, it really took the people around me because, as I said, it depends on the person. So my normal um, to somebody else is, uh, for example, if I'm usually high energy, um, and then the next day, due to my illness, I'm low energy, depressive, moody, very aggressive, a person on the street, that's normal. Maybe him just stay so, but my family and friends would know something's up with Jamar. He's not organized, he's nervous, he's agitated, he's irritable. And so it starts subtly like that. Now, what really kind of set it off is that my first episodes were very religious based. So I'd get more fanatical about religion. So my father's a pastor, right? So that's ingrained in me. So it manifests in the illness. So I believe I'm seeing demons, I'm on a mission to you know, liberate people and all sorts of something, you know. But when that was so, going on, did you think you were ill? Or you no, just I thought I was ordained. I thought I was blessed, touched, and that I'm going out and I say, all right, I have these new abilities. I guess I'm charged with this and that. And so at first it seems good. You know, your parents, nice Christian boy, wow, he's into his faith. And then it gets stranger. I'm going out late at night and missing and... Um, out on the streets with a Bible trying to yeah. sing and it's it's not making sense. So you what I'm saying and my ideas sounds great, it's very creative, but it's not dots aren't connecting. And yeah. so they, they see that there's something wrong with my cognition there. After a years long journey, mm -hmm. finding success in embracing and managing your illness to a point where you now believe it is an advantage to you. What does yeah. that mean? Because, um, especially as somebody in the creative industries, we often have to seek inspiration from external sources. I find that my mind, my brain is able to dip into a well of creativity and my brain works differently. So I don't need to smoke in order to get inspiration. I don't need to experiment. I can just simply tap into it like that. So it's an advantage to me. Once you're managing yourself and the negative sides of the illness aren't there, I think there are a few advantages. Um, that you just have to be very responsible with. For example, physiologically, I can stay up longer than most people if I have a deadline and I won't feel a thing. Um, fear, I, don't, I wouldn't process fear the way a normal person would as a limitation. We're a bit more bold. We're able to you know, take risks, we're high risk takers, which is good for entrepreneurs, people in the arts and yeah, film that yeah. requires you to stand up and say, I want this, you know what I mean? So I find that in that way, intrinsically, it became an advantage for me in my field. You also say the strong support that you receive from loved ones during your initial diagnosis is crucial. Yes, sir. Explain again. Right, so people suffering this illness tend to isolate and what that does is you're just by yourself with your ideas and you get worse and worse. Um, so you need people around you that A, know when you're going off, when you're wrong, in terms of who you really are versus what your illness is kind of inspiring you to do. And it protects you because when you're out in the world, now me in a manic state, I'm a big guy, I'm very um, 
intimidating. Some people, which has happened to me, interpret it as a threat. And so you find bipolar, bipolar people are, are at risk for violence. So, you know, you can get attacked. I had my jaw broken one night when I was a bit too manic. I was high energy. And, you know, man in Jamaica stay, we interpret it as um, a threat. So them decided to say, they going to deal with the threat. And that was through violence. So I had to, you know, get away. Luckily, as I said, in that state, I'm not processing fewer pains. I'm not feeling the jaw broken. I was able to run to the hospital and get some help. Um, so it's really important, I think, yeah. to have that yeah. family around you to say, hey, he's going off. We were yeah. talking before we came on, mm -hmm. and, and when someone looks at you now, yeah. and, and obviously you're a very intelligent uh, yeah. person, and say you have a mel mental illness, right. does that make you feel? Because it's, in effect, you don't. Do yeah, you? it's very, it's, I'm in a weird position, and as I was telling you, I try not to tap into it. Technically, you can say I have an illness that is dormant. Let's say you had asthma. Right. You no longer have any asthma attacks, but you know that you're asthmatic, right? But I, I, it feels like I'm not ill anymore. It feels like I'm just fine. I'm so how do you day. feel when, when you hear, say, you have a mental illness? How does I that feel? I feel like they're describing a dormant portion of my life that I will acknowledge as history and that I take it, you know, to take heed to not end up back yeah. there. You, right. you take medication, obviously. Yes. Is yes, this for the rest of your life? Yeah, actually. So, so the treatment the is lifelong. The prognosis is that you can't, you will never come off it. Right, so or you should not. Does that mean you're not going to, I don't want to say get better, because there's nothing yeah. really wrong with you, but mm -hmm. is there a time that you will be no longer bipolar or no? No. Well, as far as we know, we know science and um, medicine can advance, but as it stands, we are to operate as if for the rest of my life, I'm on this treatment, my therapy, my exercise, my sleep, my medication. And if those things are in play, you will never know if I have the illness. Fantastic. The other, the other thing we were talking about, that mm. same person who's very close to me, right. um, sometimes I think he uses uh, this, yeah, this. <laughs> his schizophrenia yeah. to good effect. So he might be doing something. And I say, well, I'm going to him say, well, you know, me have an illness. Too. And sometimes I feel he say, no, 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 yeah, use your head. You don't <laughs> I'm not do gonna that. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I do that sometimes. You do that sometimes but too. <laughs> sometimes it's warranted because, we, again, we still can operate differently. I, I still think... Um, so if it does, if it does some foolish, is that a man say why? He say my mama bad for that. No, yeah, you can't check me on that. <laughs> but if you see me naturally not going to sleep and staying up late, and they're like, how oh, you still up after thirty six hours? Oh, sorry, remember me less. They work less. Yeah. But if me forget to wash the plate and me say, oh, me no man, go wash the plate. <laughs> <laughs> Simple. What? Um, not what kind of medication, but how is what every week, every day, every no, month, every it six months. Be, I'm going to be very, very honest and realistic for people. It should be every single day, right? The way the medication works, it's not a cure. It acts as a surge protector. So think of the illness as a thunderstorm and you have delicate electronic components. And if a thunderstorm strikes like a trigger, it kind of soaks that up and prevents an episode. Okay. So you can technically live without it. Um, say if you forget for a day or two, I'm not going to randomly just go off. However, I'm at risk for a thunderstorm happening and frying my circuit. So you do take it every so day? So I do try to take it every day. And I'm, mm. I'm just saying, it may not happen. And as soon as I remember, I'm back on it. And there is a threshold that I've found in you know, my experience with the illness that once I pass this threshold without medication, I'm definitely at, in the red. So. Final question. What kind of support do you get from, from us? Not family we're talking about, because in other communities, if you're a registered schizophrenic, right. you're, you're actually looked after by the government and stuff. Right. Do you get any support from the ministry, from what they call it, National Health Fund, to you yeah. get any kind of support like that? Well, yeah, of course you have you know, health insurance. For example, my education is heavily subsidized, so I pay like okay. $20, All right? All right. But, Fantastic. Um, otherwise, it's just your personal therapy sessions, your psychiatrist. I think more can be done on a, a, a governmental level, as you were describing that kind of thing to me. It's yeah. very groundbreaking. I never heard about that. Yeah. Like, and I was just out here, yeah. you know, roughing it. So that a, a conversation can be had about what more we can do. And you're not the only one in your family who no, is right. bipolar. No, right. A sister who also, right. okay. you know, um, suffers. And it's to varying degrees. So she can probably go off medication way longer than me. And yeah. Everybody is different, so okay. you have to really look at it case by case. Love your Bridget. Bless up. Mm. Filmmaker, musician, Jim R. McFarlane, and there's nothing wrong with him. Because um, uh, some people feel, say, you hear that and they say, you know, something wrong with you. Um, he's, he's fine. All right, coming up, we talk Republic Roads and Culture. You might not understand that, but uh, the next interview will explain very, very clearly what we mean by that. So come, stay with us please. This is what we're doing.